Oh, there's been a lot of AMD news lately. I don't even know what's going on. My glasses are dirty. I'm kind of tired. There's been a lot of, of testing. You know, the, the Gamers Nexus hardware unboxed beast mode testing thing, not really my thing, at least not if and, and or until I have 50 people working for me. But nevertheless, this is actually very interesting uh, information and I have some stories to tell and some stuff to take a look at and we've done a lot of benchmarking and testing of our own. And so I think we're gonna take a look at the Radeon 5700 and 5700 XT. These are genuinely interesting products that are part of this crazy AMD 77 launch bonanza. So let's dive right in. I don't really know where to start. This is uh, this 77 launch AMDs on fire thing. I just I don't I don't know. Hopefully you caught our Ryzen footage, coverage, whatever you want to call it. Now it's time for Radeon coverage. The RX 5700 and the 5700 XT. As you can see behind me, up to 9.75 teraflops or 7.95 teraflops. There's, I've been flown all over the world. I've been to Computex, I've been to LA. AMD sent me these. They sent me a whole bunch of stuff in the press review kit, you know, all told. But I don't know, I'd like to, I'd like to open, you know, break the ice with a terrible story. So um, when I was, I, I think I was 12 or 13, I was trying to earn some pocket money. And so I would go around and help like fix the local computer company, fix computers. And uh, I witnessed a weird incident. The guy was about, 25 or 30 years older than me and I was just sort of watching and absorbing and, and working on things and this was like the days of the command line and like Novell Netware. Well Novell Netware is kind of on its way out I guess. So I mean it's I'm dating myself here. So we got an emergency you know four alarm fire service call. Guys down. Can't do any work. You need to come immediately and so you know, high density SCSI cables. Oh, I'll update myself here. And he's like, let me just snap that back in. And sure enough, I heard the satisfying kerchunk of like the cable snapping back into place. So the shop owner comes back and he's like, ah, oh, you know, I'm down, I can't do anything and blah, blah, blah. Cause he hadn't tried, he literally, he hadn't even tried any of the other computers. Everything was fine. And so he, the, uh, the guy that I was with hauled off and kicked the computer. And uh, the guy was like, I'm not paying for that. <laughs> and the guy that I was with was like, uh, service call, we had to drive like 30 minutes to get here. And he's like, well, I want an itemized invoice then. You know, I was like, what are you, what are you gonna do? So the invoice read, kicking the computer, $1. Knowing where and how to kick the computer, $99. And that was, that was the invoice. And so this is an extremely long-winded way of explaining the dent on the card because I think everybody else has already made all the other jokes like Linus dropped the card or whatever and so you look at the 5700 XT and it's got like this little dent thing it's a blower it's they're just they're having some fun with the design that's all it is but also at the same time I can't help but think that AMD knew exactly where to kick the marketplace for graphics cards like knowing where to kick like denting the shroud one dollar but then releasing a new architecture Navi, RDNA uh, was something else. Now RDNA, these cards are not meant to be the fastest cards that you can possibly get. They are the first iteration of a new architecture, Radeon DNA, RDNA. It is a completely new micro architecture. So like forget Vega, talking about GCN, the Radeon 7. I particularly like this card for content creation and the HBM2. It's really, really ahead of its time in a lot of ways. But, and it's really great for compute and uh, um, business applications and things like that. And it's still, this is still the, the, the speed leader. So the Radeon 7 is still the speed leader uh, in terms of just raw performance. But look, 9.75 teraflops. There's another, there's the anniversary edition that's gonna be over 10, 10 teraflops. Uh, these cards are designed to deliver very high frame rate 1080p and really good 1440p gaming experiences, but also to get the new micro architecture out the, the door for gaming cards. And so it's a different micro architecture. It's completely different under the hood. RDNA, GCN don't really have anything to do with one another. So the first card that we're gonna take a look at is the RX 5700 XT, which is 
this one and that one over there. So 40 compute units, 2560 string processors, 9.75 teraflops, eight gigs of GDDR6, not HBM memory. It's a, it's a more traditional approach. Um, there's this also, you know, the clocks here. 1905 boost, 1755 game clock, and 1605 base clock. Game clock is a new thing from AMD, and the reason that they did that is because they felt like the whole boost clock, base clock thing for existing products in the market was a little bit misleading, if I understand correctly. And that what they mean by that is that sometimes you might see the boost clock, but most of the time you're gonna be down around the base clock. And what they've done is take a look at the top 25 titles and for the top 25 titles on average, unless there's a thermal problem in your case with these blower style designs, you're gonna see the game clock. Like if you don't see the game clock, there's probably a problem or probably something going on inside your system. For the base clock, that really represents the worst case scenario. Like you're mining or doing something that is a pure compute workload. When you're playing a game, the load is gonna vary as you play the game. The game should not be pegging the GPU all the time. The game should be responding to what you're doing inside the game. And so that gives you thermal and electrical headroom to be able to do stuff. And so with the Navi architecture, you generally should be playing your game around the game clock. This card performs really well. And this was one of the cards that we benched against both of these. We also took a look at the MSI GeForce RTX 2060. Same design, again, super nice card. So. Both of these cards are faster than the 2060. This card is faster than the MSI 2070, mostly. There's a few games where that's not true. And the 5700 is almost as fast as the 2070, considerably faster than the 2060. That's not universally true, but that's basically how we want to think of it. All right, first up, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was tested with both of these cards against the 2070 and the 2060 on an Intel 9900K running at five gigahertz all core the 3700X and the 3900X. Now the 3700X had PBO on and it was allowed to stretch its legs. And that's probably the best scenario in terms of gaming because everything is all on one chiplet and some other things in the 3900X. Still working on getting some BIOS uh, updates at the time of working on this. So we're gonna look at the 3700X just with PBO enabled, but none of the custom overclocking or anything like that. Just literally just enable PBO. No tweaks other than XMP. And a 9900K at five gigahertz. So, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Shadow of the Tomb Raider historically favored Intel, but probably the last year or so, they fixed it or they've optimized it or Windows 19.03 or the scheduler or whatever. Basically, we're looking at 91 frames per second on the 9900K and 92 frames per second on the 3700X. And that's, again, with, that's within margin of error, but the 3700X and the 9900K are basically at parity, which is in our in our Ryzen review. And that's a 1440p. So it's around 92 FPS, give or take. There's a lot of really interesting stuff. There's a full article on the level one website that has a lot more information, but generally that's what you need to know. Um, GTA 5, which is sort of an old title. GTA 5 runs fine. It's a DirectX 11. It's fun to test DirectX, a DirectX 11. And it's also fun because the GTA engine breaks when you're past about 140 FPS. And if you just do like a frame time graph dump, um, it's not the best because during scene transitions and stuff like that, the frame rate's gonna be just absurdly high. So if you're gonna do analysis, you gotta go and like delete all the garbage and then analyze it. And then the stutters, if it goes over 140 FPS, you gotta limit the F. So anyway, long story short, GTA 5, actually pretty impressive on these cards. Monster Hunter World was up next. It also performed really well. It was. The 5700 XT was a little better than the 2070, and the 5700 was a little worse than the 2070, and the 5700 was also quite a bit better than the 2060. That was true on both the 3700X and the Intel 9900K. Except for the 2060, the 2060 is gonna be around 90 FPS at 1080p, which is about what it's aiming for. I mean, that's not, that's not terrible, but the 120 to 130 frame rate range uh, for both of these cards, the 5700 and the 5700 XT is pretty good. The 5700 gets close enough to the 5700 XT that it's really, I think, a good value. You've got the 5700 XT, which costs a little more, a little, and it's as good as a 2070 or better in almost all scenarios. And the 5700, which is cheaper, but a little worse than the 2070, but quite a bit better than the 2060. 
And so when you take into account the cost of like the reference model versus the Founders Edition model and the different performance, and then you look up the cost of the actual card that we tested with, which is the really awesome MSI GeForce RTX 2070, AMD does really come with the compelling price value comparison. But then there are rumors about the NVIDIA Super, and I don't have any official information on that at the time that I'm doing this video, and things are probably under embargo. It's a weird, like, I think that AMD is in a good spot with a pretty good product. And I think that NVIDIA is going to respond probably pretty viciously. So, consumers win? I think AMD knows that NVIDIA is going to respond pretty viciously. So they're looking to differentiate themselves from the software stack side of things. So at the E3 event that AMD had that I went to that was a lot of fun, um, I got to meet Scott Wasson and a bunch of the guys, well, even even the engineer guys that actually, I got to meet a lot of cool people. There's a lot of very, very intelligent people working at AMD that are also very accessible. Like they're not, super guarded, which is awesome. And it's like, hey, blah, blah, It's like, yeah, we messed that up. And then it's like, what happened with this? It's like, oh, that was a really amazing idea. It, it just turned out weird. And then it's like, how did you manage to pull this off? And it's like, well, funny story. It started with this guy that kicked a computer and it went flying in. I don't know. It was really super awesome meeting those people. And so um, there's a lot of really cool things. Fidelity FX, which is a content adaptive sharpening system. I'm still playing with that. I see what it does and I understand it and it looks cool, but I don't know enough about how it works in gaming to really say, yes, this is clearly a much better situation. Um, there are games that are incorporating it into their engine. So I think game developers are convinced that yes, this is a good, a good situation to be in. The one situation where I am convinced, so I have 4K monitors and I play at 4K a lot. I'm really hoping that ASUS will put for sale the 4K monitor of Insanity that does display stream compression because that's the monitor that I've wanted for two years. But I'm, I digress. So scaling from 1440p to 4K with new AMD software special sauce um, was better than what I've experienced on the 2080 Ti in terms of playing at 1440p at an absurd frame rate and scaling it up, but that's entirely subjective. What's not subjective is Radeon Anti-Lag. Radeon Anti-Lag, it took me a while to get my head around it. So that was another demo that Scott Watson had and he was using a modified version of OCAT and some Arduinos to actually look at like what the full stack latency is. My setup's not that fancy. I've got a mouse that's been modified with an LED. Now the cool thing about, about these mice, for those of you not in the know, Dell, yeah, Dell of all people, has some Avago based mice that you can get. So it's the same Avago sensors that you have in high-end gaming mice. I think they're probably reject uh, reject sensors. Uh, you can overclock them. You can run them at, at a thousand Hertz. It's fine, it's Avago. So I've modified one of those. I put tape over the sensor so you don't get any motion. There's only the option of the mouse being on when the processor is actually pulling the button, which is not truly a 1000 Hertz pull rate. So I got some tricks up my sleeve too. <laughs> so playing some different games, um, you can actually see the difference with Radeon Anti-Lag. I was, I was kind of shocked. I kind of figured that the setup on NVIDIA, like the default you know, VSync on type configuration on NVIDIA was, was, was probably not ideal because the VSync on configuration on the AMD side is also not ideal. And it's easy to see that in high speed video. We've done that before. We've got some really early videos that I was using at the same mouse with the LED setup from like five years ago or three years ago or a long time ago. And on the NVIDIA side, there is fast sync. And so fast sync will uh, run the graphics card like as if VSync is not on. And then so as soon as VSync triggers, it's like, okay, your next frame's ready. Let's just go ahead and hop that in. And so I figured VSync would uh, eliminate most, if not all of the advantage that Radeon Anti-Lag had. But that wasn't the case, and that, that's actually bad for another reason, let me explain. It's only about um, uh, three or four cycles of the, like, uh, of the um, frame clock that is with the video footage. And so it's not exactly three frames, it's more than three frames of 240 hertz. 
but it would be like as if it was one, like 2.75 or 2.8 frames if it was a 60 hertz stream, but it's a 240 hertz stream, so the math works out. Whereas on the Nvidia side, I was never able to get it to be less than five. So like three versus five. So we're talking about a bet, like everything that I can do to make Nvidia at parity with AMD, it looks like we're still at a an eight to 16 millisecond advantage for AMD with Radeon anti-lag. But streaming was a little disappointing with the current setup on these cards because if you just go in OBS and turn it on, and I had problems. I hope that that's fixed by the time it launches because the problem seemed just really silly uh, with the H.264 encoder. But I had problems, AMD's in the loop on it. We're gonna see what that is. Uh, if I manually set the settings, like I manually dialed in the settings and used the encoder on these cards, it looked really good. Now, these cards can also do H.265. There's a hardware H.265 encoder. Here's the mind-blowing thing. H.265 in DaVinci Resolve and Premiere is faster than H.265 encoding on a 2080 Ti. The clickbait would be 5700 XT is faster than a 2080 Ti. And for H.265 encoding, that is absolutely true. Um, Epos Vox, Adam from Epos Vox came down and we worked on some stuff together and so that was a lot of fun. And we did DaVinci Resolve testing and all kinds of other stuff. So you should check out his channel because he's also got footage and stuff that's coming out on launch day that dives into that a little more. I'm 99.75% sure that the OBS access to the H.264 encoder is gonna be fixed if not actually on launch day. And I'll pin a comment but probably very shortly thereafter, if it's not actually already fixed. If you're thinking about using one of these on Linux, you should wait. Um, I did a video on the Linux channel, you can check that out. Uh, Ryzen for Linux, generally pretty amazing. A couple small teething issues. And so in conclusion, if you're looking for uh, flawless 1440p gaming, or really high frame rate, like above 100 hertz frame rate, gaming in, 100, in 1080p and really 1440p for a lot of games, especially if you go like medium, you should really give the 5700 and the 5700 XT a look. I think the 5700 is a much better deal, but you know, prices can be adjusted after launch and prices can be adjusted in response to market forces. And I think you should probably give it a week or two and, and see what shakes out because things are really interesting. Competition's heating up. I'm Wendell, this is level one. If you enjoyed this video, there's a thing. If you didn't enjoy it, there's also a thing. If you have some feedback, there's another thing for that. And uh, knowing, <laughs> knowing where to support the channel, free. Knowing, I don't know, I was gonna tie that in to the rambly thing at the beginning, but I don't know. It's an exciting time. PCI Express 4, these are PCI Express 4. I didn't mention that, but yeah, these are PCI Express 4, which you need a Ryzen 3000 series CPU and an X570 motherboard in order to do that. Maybe that's why some of the, uh, the 1% lows and the 0.1% lows were, it seemed like they were a little higher, not universally, but in a lot of cases. But take a look at the data for yourself, crunch the numbers. So you might come to a different conclusion than I did, but you know, just very high level, looks pretty good. And the software is only gonna get better.